Let's pray. Jesus, you said, I am the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so that's where I find myself now, saved and going in and out and in right now to this pulpit to enjoy pasture as you feed me and I pray that we would feast on you together. So give us pasture, Lord. Give us still waters and and green pastures and satisfy our souls on yourself. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 72 times in the book of Ezekiel, God says that he does everything he does that you may know that I am the Lord. Ten more times, he simply says, I am the Lord. Whether it's terrible punishments or thrilling salvation, the aim is the same, that you may know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 33, 29, they will know that I am the Lord when I have made the land a desolation because of all their abominations. Ezekiel 20, verse 44, you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways, O house of Israel. So 72 times plus 10, that you may know that I am the Lord, that you may know that I am the Lord, that you may know that I am the Lord. Why? Now, we need to reflect on the word Lord for just a moment to get the real force of this. You know that when the word Lord occurs in your Old Testament, in all caps, it's not referring to a title, king, governor, monarch, it's referring to a proper name, Yahweh, or the old King James, Jehovah. It's not a title, it's a name, like Mike, Mary. And most people have names in the Bible that have meaning, like you would name your daughter Charity, because you hope she grows up to be a compassionate and kind young woman. And God gave himself a name, not a title, a name with a meaning. And I'm going to read you the paragraph where he gives the meaning of his name so that every time in the Bible that you may know that I am the capital (coughs) L-O-R-D, it's like that you may know that I am James. James. (coughs) which doesn't make any sense at all, except that James would have a meaning. Yahweh has a meaning. So here's the meaning. This is, if you've got a Bible, but you don't, I'm sure. This is a lecture, I suppose. But some of you are reaching, that's great. You all have phones. This is Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. 
So the name Yahweh is built on the name, the verb, I am. I am who I am has sent you. Tell them that's my name, Yahweh. Therefore, when Ezekiel 72 times plus 10 says, God is doing everything that you may know that he is Yahweh, he is reminding us over and over and over again, never, never, never forget, you're dealing with the God who absolutely is. He is who he is. He does what he does. <clears throat> he wills what he wills. He has mercy on whom he will have mercy. He hardens whom he will harden. He is not owing to anybody for anything. He's not becoming. He's not what he is because something went before. He's not striving to be something. Nothing outside himself is shaping him into what he is. He just is. He's absolutely there forever. 72 times, don't forget this. It's why I do everything I do. You must no, 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 no. 72 times, no, this. It's what you must know. Ezekiel wanted us to know that the ultimate, absolute, all-important, primary reality in the universe that should dominate our consciousness all day long, every day, is the God who is. Yahweh, I am who I am and do what I do. When you look at your watch, you should be aware this watch is dependent on God, and God is not dependent. When you look at the starry skies at night, you should think God flung them out with his little finger, and they are utterly, totally, every millisecond dependent on his willing them to be. And he is not the least dependent on this universe to be. And when you look at each other, your family, you should think, that person is absolutely, totally dependent for being on God, and God is not the least shaped by them. We are dependent on God, sustained by God, designed by God, governed by God, and He is not dependent or sustained or designed or governed by us at all. And Ezekiel says 72 times, don't you forget that. That's my name. That's my name. And you should know it, know it, know it, know it. The point of Ezekiel saying over and over and over again, you shall know that I'm Yahweh. You shall know that I'm Yahweh. You shall know that I'm Yahweh. 79 plus, 72 plus 10 is that God is absolutely the point of every sing. He is the supreme reality in the universe, in America, in Texas, in your family, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, in your heart. Yahweh is his name. He absolutely is. He is more important, more pervasive, more relevant, more glorious, more beautiful, more satisfying than anything. The reason Jonathan Edwards has a dominant place in my life is because outside the Bible, no one in the last 50 years has helped me more than Edwards to live in the light of Ezekiel's God-entranced vision of life. Nobody. Nobody that I've ever read, nobody that, I, that I've ever met who is living is more God-besotted than Jonathan Edwards. Nobody that I know, nobody that I've ever heard of 
is more God entranced as he looks at the world than Jonathan Edwards was. And no one has helped me more than Edwards to see and experience the relationship between the supremacy of God and the satisfaction of the soul like Edwards. In other words, nobody outside the Bible has shaped my Christian hedonism more than Jonathan Edwards. The most important one-sentence commentary or description, definition of Christian hedonism that carries all the radical implications of the pursuit of joy, if you think it through, is this one. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. In other words, the fulfillment of Ezekiel's mandate to live constantly in and under and for the supreme importance and centrality and glory of God's absolute being, the fulfillment of that vision by Ezekiel will not happen in the life of anyone who is half-hearted about the pursuit of your joy in God. Few people, if any, have made this clearer than Edwards. Here's the key quote. I would rank this in the top three quotes that have impacted me from Edwards. God glorifies himself toward the creature in two ways. One, by appearing to their understanding. Two, in communicating himself to their hearts and in their rejoicing in and delighting in and enjoying the manifestation which he makes of himself. God is glorified not only by his, joy, his glory being seen, but by its being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. His glory is then received by the whole soul, both by the understanding and the heart. That's the seed and the summary of Christian hedonism. Here's the key sentence. God is glorified not only by His glories being seen. So when you read your Bible or you look at the stars and you see the radiance of God's beauty and you write a poem or a sentence or a theological treatise about it, that's good and to some degree reflects God's glory. And if you feel little about what you just wrote, you rob him. You dishonor him. He gets half his glory, your head half. It's not a saving half, by the way, because the devil can do that. He can't do the other half. Once you plant this seed, all, all I do is make it rhyme. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in God. Once, once you plant that in that seed in your mind and water it with a little reflection, the implications for your life, <laughs> they spring up and grow in every direction like branches laden with delicious fruit. For example, here's Edwards. Persons need not and ought not, that word ought there is right at the heart of the meaning of Christian hedonism. 
Persons need not and ought not set any bounds to their spiritual and gracious appetites. Rather, they ought to be endeavoring by all possible ways to inflame their desires and to obtain more spiritual pleasures. Endeavor to promote spiritual appetites by laying yourself in the way of allurement. That needs a lecture. Take that phrase home tonight. Lay yourself in the way of allurement. There is no such thing as excess in our taking of the spiritual food. There is no such virtue as temperance in spiritual feasting. It's not a virtue to have limited appetite spiritually. This is the disease of our churches. Appetites for Jesus are so constricted, they're so limited, and appetites for the world are massive and being cultivated every day by every media possible. Here's his implication for preaching. I should think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections of my hearers. Affections is, a, is an 18th century word for, in his vocabulary, spiritual emotions. Don't treat them as some kind of ethereal, something other than real happiness, real pleasure, real joy, real hate, real gratitude, real hope, real fear. These, this constellation of, this, this thing in here is a desire factory. It's a longing factory. It's an emotion factory. And there are dozens of emotions with all kinds of extensions to them. So start that sentence over again. I should think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections of my hearers as high as I possibly can, provided that they are affected with nothing but truth and with affections that are not disagreeable to the nature of what they are affected with. Like, don't smile when preaching on hell. And, and don't frown when celebrating the glories of heaven. Bring your heart and your whole bearing into, what's his word, agreeableness to the nature of what you are affected with. And then you can lift the affections as high as possible, provided they are rooted in truth and conformable to the nature of what you are being affected by. That's really a good sentence for every preacher. My thesis here is that Edwards is a Christian hedonist. So I pose the question, my answer is yes. <laughs> so a Christian hedonist, brief definition, Christian hedonist is a person who lives to maximize the depth and the height and the duration of joy in God in all the ways that God in Christ has made it possible for us to do. We live, we live to maximize our joy in God in its depths and heights and duration in all the ways that God in Christ has made it possible for us to pursue. That's a Christian hedonist. And my contention is that not only is he a Christian hedonist, Jonathan Edwards, but that he is one of the most God-besotted, God-enthralled, God 
trance, God-centered Christian hedonist who ever lived, and that even though he was a mere New England pastor who died 260 years ago, who never traveled outside of New England, got voted out of his church after 23 years of ministry, served as a missionary to a handful of Indians for the last seven years of his life, died at age 54, only 300 books in his library, not 100,000. He is worthy of our attention, and that's what we're going to do is pay attention to Edwards now for the next little while. Here's the way I would like to pay attention to Edwards and his worthiness to be listened to. Um, I want to hear him respond to two criticisms that I have heard from people to the effect that he was not a Christian hedonist. So two arguments against my thesis. So I'm going to let him respond. And then secondly, I want to hear his response to six or seven criticisms of me and my Christian hedonism. Instead of me defending me, I'm going to let Edwards defend me <laughs> tonight. Okay, that's, that's the plan. So here's number one. Two arguments against his being a Christian hedonist. And the two ar arguments are, are these. Number one, he criticized a life devoted to self-love. That's argument number one. Argument number two, he promoted a life devoted to, quote, disinterested love of God. Disinterested love of God. That's a 18th century phrase. Now, the problem with the first argument is that Edwards used this as the term self-love in two senses, at least, not just one, approving of one, and disapproving of the other. And in the approving of one definition, he shows himself to be a Christian hedonist. And the problem with the second argument is that what you think in your head as a typical 21st century person, unless you're schooled in 18th century thought, by the phrase disinterested love is not what he meant by it, probably. Okay, so that let me take those one at a time and let him solve the problem issue for us. First, the self-love issue. Edwards uses the term self-love negatively, disapprovingly, when he gives it the meaning of selfishness, meaning a narrowing down of what pleases us to private pleasures that exclude your happiness from my happiness. So if I can be happy and step on you to get there, not a problem. Just so I get happy. That's narrow, constricted, exploitive self-love. And Edwards hates it and criticizes it. So here's what he says. In negative sense, he says that people who are governed by self-love, quote, place their happiness in good things that are confined or limited to themselves, to the exclusion of others. This is selfishness. This is the thing most clearly and directly intended by that self-love which the Scripture condemns. And of course, no one should live that way. But then he explains another meaning of the term self-love, which shows that he's a Christian hedonist. Here's what he asks, quote, whether or not a man ought to love God more than himself. That's the question he poses. Whether or not a man ought to love God more than himself. Here's his answer. Self-love taken in the most extensive sense, and love to God are not properly capable of being compared with one another, for they are not opposites. Self-love is only a capacity for enjoying or taking delight in anything. Now, surely, tis improper 
to say that our love to God is superior to our general capacity of delighting in anything. It's like asking, this is me talking now, it's like asking, should my happiness be in God, should my happiness in God be more intense than my happiness? It's like asking, should I love God more than I love? Those are nonsense questions. And they are nonsense questions because they attempt to contrast two things that are not distinct. The pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of happiness in God. You can't ask which of those is stronger. It's not a reasonable question. It's a nonsense question. So self-love is rejected by Edwards as evil when it means the confinement of our desire for happiness to our private, self-exalting benefits. But when it means the love of happiness without any confinement and with God as its chief object, expanding to include others in it, then self-love is not only permitted, it is necessary to an eternal life of joy that the Bible promises. So the the self-love that Edwards approves is desiring your greatest happiness and finding it in God. And all that he is for us in Christ, which is exactly what a Christian hedonist believes. Now, if that doesn't make any sense, you need to write on a question and say, say that again or whatever. But that's my answer to the first objection, that Edwards disapproved of a life of self-love, therefore he can't be a Christian hedonist. And my answer is, he disapproved of one kind of self-love, he approved of the other kind, and the other kind is what makes him a Christian hedonist, because the other kind defines self-love as the pursuit of your happiness, and you maximize it by finding it in God. Here's the answer to the second question or the second argument against his being a Christian hedonist, namely that he commended a life of disinterested love to God, which sure sounds like, to most modern ears, mine anyway, sounds like um, you're supposed to love God without pursuing any interest, any benefit, any joy, any reward from him. And Edward shocks us out of our misunderstanding of that phrase by using another one, namely disinterested delight, which is a total oxymoron for most modern ears, like bored enthusiasm, sad happiness, right? disinterested delight. Like, he doesn't even crack a smile when he uses that phrase. That makes as much sense, and to his 18th century philosophical contemporaries, as anything. Why why would that be? It just shows how careful you have to be when reading things outside your little world, and you think they look anti-Christian hedonist, how slow you need to be to jump to that conclusion. So here's the quote from Religious Affections where he talks about disinterested delight. What in the world? As it is with love, the love of the saints, so it is with their joy and spiritual delight and pleasure. The first foundation of it The first foundation of your spiritual delight is not any consideration or conception of your interest in divine things, but 
It primarily consists in the sweet entertainment that your minds have in the view or contemplation of the divine and holy beauty of these things as they are in themselves. So, disinterested love to God cannot be contrary to Christian hedonism because it consists in the sweet entertainment that the mind has as it contemplates God's beauty. If you took away the sweetness and the delight, there would be nothing left of the essence of love for God. I wonder if you agree with that. I bet some of you don't. So what Edwards means when he commends love that is disinterested is that we love God, that is delight in God, enjoy God, find satisfaction in God as our supreme treasure, first and foundationally because of his intrinsic worth and beauty, not because of any benefits other than that delight, like health, wealth, and prosperity. Christian hedonism abominates the prosperity gospel. First criticism I got when I wrote my first article in his magazine in 1970-something was from a missions leader in California who said, here, just another American expression of the old prosperity gospel. And I said, you didn't read it. You didn't read it. What he's saying here is, if your delight, your satisfaction, your happiness, your joy in God is not in God, but only the kickback of health, the kickback of a marriage that works, the kickback of kids that follow Jesus. You don't love God. You love your kids. You love your wife. You love your job. You love your fame. And you're an idolater. So, (laughs) this is not part of the prosperity gospel. This is an ax to the root. Really radical, sharp, Acts to the root of the prosperity gospel because it says God is glorified when we are satisfied in Him and not His gifts, which is why suffering and sacrifice and death are the way God chooses for many of His children to glorify Him most because they find fullest satisfaction in Him at that very moment. So my conclusion on this first part, namely that there's these two arguments brought against Edwards as a Christian hedonist, that he he renounced a life of self-love and he promoted a life of disinterest to God. Both of those arguments collapse when you listen to Edwards, when you learn how to read and watch how he unpacks each of those phrases in a radically Christian hedonist way. So here's here's the last section of this talk, namely, what help can Edwards give to John Piper, who over the years has listened as criticisms come against Christian hedonism? Does Edwards help me answer those criticisms? And and the answer is yes, and I want you to listen to him. And, And in the process, I think your understanding of Christian hedonism and his role in it will become clearer. Objection number one, and we'll, uh, I didn't even see when I started here, but we'll tick these off as quickly as we can. There's six or seven of them, and they go by pretty fast, so hang on. Write your questions down. Objection one, doesn't Christian hedonism, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, doesn't Christian hedonism make me central in salvation? Doesn't it put me at the bottom of my joy and make me the focus of the universe? Edwards answers with a very penetrating distinction between the joy of the hypocrite 
and the joy of the true Christian. Here it goes like this. This is the difference between the joy of the hypocrite and the joy of the true saint. The hypocrite rejoices in himself. Self is the first foundation of his joy. The true saint rejoices in God. True saints have their minds in the first place inexpressibly pleased and delighted with the sweet ideas of the glorious and amiable nature of the things of God. This is the spring of all their delights, the cream of all their pleasures. But the dependence of the affections of the hypocrite is in a contrary order. They first rejoice that they are made much of by God, and then on that ground, he seems a sort lovely to them. That's devastating. That is devastating. I mean, I've, I've grown up, I've, I've, I've ministered for the last 50 years in, in, a, in a world where self-esteem it's kind of faded in the background now, but for, for decades, it was the motif of counseling. It was the motif of education. It was the motif of, of incarceration fixing. It, it was just, it was the air everybody breathed, and God was made a servant to it. And the cross was turned into an exaltation of it. And Edwards just slices it to pieces. And, and saves us. He saves us. I'll read that last sentence again. The hypocrite first rejoice that they are made much of by God, and then on that ground he seems a sort lovely to them. That's totally upside down. I will love you Provided you are making much of me. Which means who's God? That's his answer to my first objection. Doesn't it make me central? Emphatically, it does not. Number two, won't this emphasis of Christian hedonism on pleasure play into the central corruption of our age, the unbounded pursuit of personal ease and comfort and sensual pleasures? Won't this emphasis soften our resistance to sin? I like these objections. I wrote them. <laughs> I feel them. Feel the dangers of them. I know how deceitful my heart is. There are many Christians who think stoicism is a good antidote to sensuality. And we live in an age drowning in sensuality. Just turn on any program. And if the program isn't, the ads are. Drowning in sensuality. And many people think stoicism is a good antidote. Paul emphatically in Colossians 2.23 said it will never work. It will never work. Willpower religion will not work against the flesh. And the reason it fails is that the power of sin comes from its promise of pleasure. Nobody sins out of duty. We sin because Sin promises pleasure, and it is meant to be defeated by the promise of a superior pleasure in God, not a religion of willpower. It won't work. Willpower religion, even when it succeeds, fails because the will gets the glory. It produces legalists, not lovers. Edwards saw the powerlessness of this approach, and here's what he said. We come with double forces against the wicked to persuade them to a godly life. 
The common argument is the profitableness of religion. But alas, the wicked man is not in pursuit of profit. Tis pleasure he seeks. Now then, we will fight them with their own weapons. In other words, Edward says the pursuit of pleasure in God is not only not a compromise with the sensuality of the world, it's the only weapon that can defeat it. Because it produces lovers of God, not legalists who boast in their willpower. If you love holiness, and if you weep over the moral collapse of American culture, you will do well to get to know Edward's vision of the power of the pleasure of God as the axe laid to the root of the promises of sin. You try to raise teenagers? Will tower religion will not take hold. It will last about as long as they're in your house. They've got to love God. A miracle has to happen. They've got to love holiness. They've got to delight in Him above everything the world is throwing at them. So my answer is no, Christian hedonism does not play into the sensual corruptions of our culture. It points to the one power that provides God-exalting freedom, namely the promise of superior pleasure in God. Objection number three, surely contrition, sorrow for sin, is a painful thing and will be undermined by the stress on seeking our own pleasure. Surely, the beginning of revival is brokenhearted contrition for our sin, but you seem to make the awakening of delight the beginning. The answer to this objection is that no one can feel brokenhearted for not treasuring God until that person tastes the pleasure of having God as their treasure. That's a complicated sentence. Maybe I better say it again. No one can feel brokenhearted for not treasuring God, which is what contrition should be not treasuring God. You, you've treasured other things more than God. No one can feel brokenhearted for not treasuring God until that person tastes the pleasure of having God as his treasure. You can't feel remorse for not having what you don't want. I know this sounds paradoxical, um, Pleasure makes the pain of brokenheartedness possible. That's what I'm arguing. Pleasure in God makes the pain of brokenheartedness for not having the pleasure possible. You'd never recognize it otherwise. In order to bring people to the sorrow of contrition, you must first bring them to see God as their supreme delight so that they can regret that he hasn't been so. Let me read Edwards. This is where I, you know, when you, when you read somebody who's thought a hundred miles ahead of you on almost everything, it's wonderful. <laughs> Just wonderful. Though repentance be a deep sorrow for sin that God requires as necessary to salvation, yet the very nature of it necessarily implies delight. 
Repentance of sin is a sorrow arising from the sight of God's excellency and mercy, but the apprehension of excellency and mercy must necessarily and unavoidably beget pleasure in the mind of the beholder. It is impossible that anyone should see anything that appears to him excellent and not behold it with pleasure. And it's impossible to be affected with the mercy and love of God and his willingness to be merciful to us and love us and not be affected with the pleasure at the thoughts of it. But this is the very affection that begets true repentance. How much soever a paradox it may seem, it is true that repentance is a sweet sorrow so that the more of this sorrow, the more pleasure. There are people in the world who have gone very deep with God, and we need to listen to them. This is astonishing and true, what he just said. If if you have lived long with Christ and are aware of your own indwelling sin, you will have found it to be so. Yes, there is contrition. Yes, There are tears of remorse and brokenheartedness. I dare say, every day. But they flow from a new taste of the soul for the pleasures at God's right hand that you have scorned. And if you don't taste them, you won't feel remorse for scorning them. I don't know how to make it clearer right now. This is really important for you, for all of us. So, no, gospel contrition is not undermined by Christian hedonism. It is made possible by revealing what we missed. Objection number four. Surely, elevating the pursuit of joy to such an importance as you do, Piper, will overturn the teaching of Jesus about self-denial. How can you affirm a passion for pleasure as the driving force of the Christian life and at the same time embrace the teaching of Jesus about self-denial? Edwards turns this objection right on its head. So did Jesus. So many people read Mark 8, 34, he would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Period. Stop. Cross. Bear. Suffer. Deny. Period. Like, wait a minute. There's another verse. For, for, ground, he who would save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake in the Gospels saved it. What kind of an argument is that? You want to you save your life? Lose it. That's a strategy for saving it. Jesus isn't interested in sending people to hell. He came to save. So lose it. Now, Edwards turns this objection in his own way on its head like this. He argues that self-denial not only does not contradict the quest for joy, but in fact destroys the root of sorrow and paves the way for joy. Here's the the quote. Self-denial will also be reckoned among the troubles of the godly. Yes, it is. But whoever has tried self-denial can give in his testimony that they never experience greater pleasure and joys than after great acts of self-denial. Self-denial destroys the very root and foundation of sorrow. (laughs) He was scratching. And is nothing else 
but the lancing of a grievous and painful sore that effects a cure and brings abundance of health as a recompense for the pain of the operation. You've tasted this. You've tasted this. You're sitting there at the computer, right? Pornography is just one click away. Everything in you, 30% of you women, all of you men know what I'm talking about. At least that's what I've read. I don't know anything about women. I've never been one. (laughs) So you're just a millisecond away. Women out of curiosity, men out of lust. Just pure lust. You're that far away. And God shows up. And you sever that craving for worldly two-bit half pleasures. And he triumphs for you, and you lose it. You lose the pleasure and sleep like a baby. Don't think self-denial is about making you miserable. It's about saving you. Objection number five. Becoming a Christian adds more trouble to life and brings persecutions, reproaches, suffering, even death. Witness a week ago. It is misleading, therefore, to say that the essence of being a Christian is joy. There are overwhelming losses. There are overwhelming sorrows in the Christian life. Piper, get a life. This would be a compelling objection in a world like ours, so full of suffering, so full of hostility to Christianity, if God were not sovereign and God were not good and God were not wise. Edwards is unwavering in his biblical belief, God designs all the afflictions of the godly for the increase of their everlasting joy. Say that again. Edwards argues, God designs all the afflictions of the godly for the increase of their everlasting joy. He puts it in a striking way when he says this, religion, meaning Christianity, brings no new troubles upon a man, but what have more pleasures than trouble? (laughs) Religion brings no new troubles upon a man, except those troubles that have more pleasure than trouble. In other words, the only troubles that God permits in the lives of Christians are those that will bring more pleasure than trouble with them when all things are considered. He cites four passages of Scripture. Number one, Matthew 5.11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. And be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And Hebrews 10.34, you joyfully, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. 
In other words, yes, becoming a Christian adds more trouble to your life. It does. We should never win people to Christ by promising them less trouble. We should tell them, no, count on more, not less, more. Count the cost. Yes, becoming a Christian means more trouble and brings persecutions, reproaches, suffering, and Jesus said, some of you they will kill. This is not unexpected, all right? If you think Christians being killed is unexpected, you just don't read your Bible or don't take it seriously. We better start taking it seriously. Yes, there are overwhelming losses and sorrows but the pursuit of infinite pleasure in God and the confidence that Christ purchased it for us does not contradict these sufferings, but carries them, carries them. Objection number six, doesn't the elevation of joy to such a supreme position lead away from the humility and brokenness that ought to mark the Christian? Doesn't it have the flavor of triumphalism? That very thing that Edwards disapproved of in the revival excesses of his own day? It could be taken that way. Christian hedonism could be taken that way. All truths can be distorted and misused. But... Um, if this happens, it will not be the fault of Jonathan Edwards. The God-enthralled vision of Jonathan Edwards does not make a person presumptuous. It makes him meek. Listen to these beautiful words. I, I think this is probably just about the most beautiful paragraph he ever wrote. I can remember reading it in Germany in 71 in a rocking chair. I can smell the book because it was a very, very old book from the 17th, 18th century. All gracious affections are a sweet aroma to Christ that fill the soul with a Christian heavenly sweetness and fragrancy. They are broken-hearted affections. A truly Christian love, either to man or God, is a humble, broken-hearted love. The desires of the saints, however earnest, are humble desires. Their hope is a humble hope. Their joy, even when it is unspeakable and full of glory, is a humble, broken-hearted joy. I remember stopping. I remember stopping when I read that, thinking, I've never had that category in my mind at all. Broken-hearted joy. I've just never had that category in my head. Broken-hearted joy. And there it was. And I thought, yeah. I mean, without that, we are going to be triumphalistic. We're going to go strutting through the world, tell people to be happy in Jesus, and the flavor about it will be just all wrong. It'll be all wrong. Even when it is unspeakable and full of glory, it is a humble, broken-hearted joy and leaves the Christian more poor in spirit, more like a little child, more disposed to a universal lowliness of behavior. Now, sensitive point. I don't presume uh, or claim that Edwards lived up to his teachings. He himself would not have claimed that he lived up to his teachings. No preacher lives up to his preachings. If he does, he's not preaching high enough. <laughs> Edwards fell seriously short on the issue of slavery. He owned a slave. And this has undermined his usefulness to many people. And it is a sadness for those of us who love him. Wouldn't it be for you if you found out one of your heroes was not all you thought he was? 
But this paragraph right here seems to me to contain seeds of brokenheartedness for such failures. The ones he didn't recognize, the ones we do. And these seeds are deeply embedded in his Christian hedonism, which leads finally to the last objection. Piper, you've talked a long time tonight. Where's the cross of Jesus? Where's justification by faith alone? Where's the blood? Where's regeneration by the Spirit? The answer is that the wrath-absorbing death of Jesus Christ crucified, we call it propitiation, the wrath-absorbing death of Jesus Christ crucified, and the divine act of God becoming 100% for us on the basis of Christ through faith alone, we call that justification and the creation of a new heart in us, a heart of faith, which we call regeneration, all of that, Edwards makes plain, is the great and indispensable foundation of eternal happiness with God. So here's the closing quote, and I'll be done. The redeemed, the redeemed, have all their objective good in God. God himself is the great good which they are brought to the possession and enjoyment of by redemption. He is the highest good and the sum of all good which Christ purchased. God is the inheritance of the saints. He is the portion of their souls. God is their wealth and treasure, their food, their life, their dwelling place, their ornament and diadem, and their everlasting honor and glory. The glorious excellencies and beauty of God will be forever, will forever entertain the minds of the saints. And the love of God will be their everlasting feast. The redeemed will enjoy other things. They will enjoy angels and will enjoy one another. But that which they shall enjoy in angels or in each other or anything else whatsoever that will yield them delight and happiness will be what will be seen of God in them. That's what Christ died for. That God would be eternally and supremely glorified through the saints being eternally and supremely satisfied in him. That's the goal of Christian hedonism. That's the goal of Edwards. That's my goal. I believe it's the goal of God in all of redemptive history. So Father, as we turn now to think more together in questions and answers. Come, apply these things to us. This is not a mere lecture or academic exercise. This is an encounter with biblical reality that says we do not glorify you if we are not satisfied in you above everything else in the world. This is really serious. So come, work this in your people by your miraculous spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What are the top three things that the Western church needs to change to reach an increasingly skeptical world? And it doesn't have to be the top three, but what off of your head is something that the church needs to change to reach an increasingly skeptical world. I'm, I'm not sure the world is increasingly skeptical. I think it's always been deeply, deeply skeptical. It has new forms. You're, you're thinking America when you say that, because America used to be such a predominantly uh, white, Protestant-dominated reality. It's not anymore. It's over. The story's over. And uh, we're waking up from the, from the dream world of being a 
thinking we're not a footnote in world history. We are a footnote. So that's my first response. The second thing is become Christian hedonists. I, I think, you know, we were at the, this, I'll follow up on the debate with the, with the panel. Uh, there was concern on the panel or expressed that uh, since you don't like the word fun, what's your response to Christians who think, to, to people who think Christians are, are duds and they don't have a good time? I don't, I don't think very many people are in hell today because we don't have good parties. I think a lot of people are in hell today because we don't love well. I mean, seriously well. P- parties don't save people. Come on, give me a break. We, people are not brought to their senses by watching Christians click their heels. They are brought to their senses by watching Christians lay down their lives for other people. So let's do more of that. I've, I've, uh, I've got a new word for you the next time we have our dialogue. Instead of fun, I'm going to use the phrase sweet entertainment <laughs> because I reckon you won't fuss with in, Jonathan work Edwards. in the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I mean, sweet entertainment. How do you grow desire to be allured by God and kill shallow desires? How do you grow desire to be allured? Yeah, yeah. Um, pray and read your Bible. Can faith, I? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God doesn't just mean at the beginning of life, it means all the way through life. And faith, according to John 6 35, is a coming to God to be satisfied in Him. I am the bread of life. Who comes to me shall never thirst. Who believes in me shall never hunger. And therefore, if that's what faith is, and faith comes by hearing, then we need to to listen every day to the Word of God. Or Galatians 3, 5 says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, which is what we need to happen, right? If does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so, excuse me, do so by hearing with faith or by works of the law? And the answer is hearing with faith. Hearing what? Hearing the Word of God. So I don't know any other answer than the good old-fashioned answer is set aside an hour every morning or whatever you can and linger long meditatively and prayerfully crying out to God, open my eyes to see wonderful things. Because if you see the wonderful things that are here, your affections will be awakened. If you don't see them, they won't awaken your affections. So prayer is what you, you, you pour over, over this book. May I add a word? You may. It's your party. <laughs> I will say... Sweet entertainment. I will say, I will say the same thing you just said, but I'll use a different passage. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added, but here's the key. For wherever your treasure is, there you will find your heart. So if you invest in your treasure in seeking God and who he is and what he has done for you and how he has changed your life, the allure will be there. If you invest your treasure in something else, the allure will be there. Where you invest your treasure, there you'll find your heart. Fair? Fair. Okay. I'm one out of two with him this weekend. What, What do you say to people struggling to shun worldliness and find satisfaction in God? Related question, but what do you say? In fact, it's the same question. Um, okay, then we're skipping. No, Favorite? no, 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 no. It gives me a chance to go back and, and clarify, lest I was too hard on free on uh, willpower. Okay, so I, I, I really dumped. I got angry at willpower religion because Paul does in Colossians two twenty three. However, he does say, "Kill sin." You know, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you kill sin. That's not a gentle passage. Kill it. So if your skin starts to creep up on you, slit its throat. (laughs) Which is is why the the one weapon in the armor in in Ephesians 6 is is a sword. It's the one offensive weapon. It's the only weapon you kill things with, right? You don't kill people with your shield or your helmet. 
you can headbutt a, a reporter, but you can't, you can't, you, you can't kill a reporter with your helmet, but you can stick him. So the, if, if you were, what was the sentence again? She said, he said. It's on the floor. How do you, you're struggling to, what was the word? Something? Shun. 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 Yes. Okay. So like this, and this is a, this is a promise and you stick it. You stick it with the promise of God, and there is a sense of really strong willing at that moment. I'm willing. I'm not just passively saying, give me more satisfaction, give me more satisfaction. I'm actually opposing my sin. So I don't want to be unbiblical in my overemphasis on opposing willpower. And again, if this is my party, I'll add one more cause. Often we are told to stand and fight and stand against him, but we're also told to flee from certain temptations too. There comes a time where instead of standing Absolutely. and sticking, turn and run, yep. because you don't need to linger in front of the computer. Yep. Yep. Favorite book by Jonathan Edwards and why? Say that again. Favorite book by oh. Jonathan Edwards and why? Related question also in here. If someone wants to start reading Edwards, where do they start? Yeah. Well. Joe Rigney should answer the question. He knows Edwards better than I do. Teaches at Bethlehem. Um, the most important book I ever read by Edwards was The End for Which God Created the World because it shaped my whole worldview. The End for Which God Created the World. The most, the most practically convicting and moving book is The Religious Affections. If you want to start with a book, that's where I'd start. I'd start with The Religious Affections. It will devastate you. You'll wonder if you're a Christian when you're done, which, is, which isn't altogether bad, provided God has mercy and rescues you from the pit of, of self-doubt that it creates. Um, if, if you want to start with slower, it's hard. It, a lot of people don't read 400-page books. And his sermons uh, just go online. All, everything ever, ever, Edwards ever wrote is available online. And, and find a sermon with an intriguing title, like, like you know, don't resist any appetite for Jesus or something and read it. It'll take you 15, 20 minutes to read it. That's what I, I'd do if you don't want to do a big book. All right. I'm touched by this question. What advice would you give if I have no joy in Bible reading and prayer? Yeah. Um, we, we all are in that situation from time to time. So don't consider yourself unique. This is not like, oh, I got over that season of my life. That will never happen. That will never happen in this life. You'll, you'll have seasons where every line shines like you're eating a feast, and you'll have seasons where the lines seem as blank as they can possibly be for days on end, maybe weeks on end, maybe months on end. So that's the first thing to say is you're not, you're not a unique kind of person, you're in a, a sad moment or season. And what, what I would say is, um, don't be content to settle for willpower religion. I can still read my Bible, I can still pray, and feelings don't matter. They do matter, they matter a lot. So I-O-U-S is what I, <laughs> I use. Brian has it written in his Bible, I have it written in my head. I pray, incline my heart to your testimonies, that's I. I pray, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things, that's O. I pray, unite my heart to fear your name, that's you. And I pray, satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love, that's S, I-O-U-S. And they're all quotes from the Psalms, which means Psalms are books that connect with our miseries and so linger over the Psalms and pray Amen. the Psalms. Amen. Okay. Um, how can one delight in God more than in the kickbacks? Help. Um, maybe if, if that doesn't seem like something that's rational or possible, pick, pick a person in your life, spouse, child, whatever. Would, would you say, husbands, would you say to your wife, I just love you so much so that you'll make me a nice supper tonight? She won't like that. <laughs> She'll say, I don't think that's what love is. I love you so much so that you'll fix me a nice supper tonight. 
or that she'll be ready for sex tonight. So if you know that, you feel that. She wants to be cherished because she is she, not because she's going to do something for you, fix you a meal, be good in bed, work with you on some project. She just, can you just, can I feel cherished by you? And if, if you get that, you, you can get that with God, can't you? You can get that. Like, that so I, I'm sure if Joe, who, who wrote a good book on things of earth to, to answer that question better than I do, um, he would say that all those gifts are not primarily designed by God as temptations. Because they're, they're going to be there in the new heavens and the new earth in some form. Like our bodily existence, with all the benefits of bodily existence, are, is not going to be wiped out in the eschaton. It's going to be there. Well, why if it's just trouble? Well, it's not just trouble. It's revelation. God means to, to be known better because of bacon. <laughs> For those of you who so, keep kosher, so the, he means turkey bacon. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> I just tried it this morning. I, I, I first got my cereal, did the best I could with the cereal they had over at the Garden Inn, which is pretty not what I eat at home. <laughs> and then when I was done and I had my, my blackberries and my blueberries and my special K and my granola and, and, and I was done, I looked over there and I saw that bacon. And I went over and I got three strips of bacon. Because I never eat bacon. We don't cook breakfast. We eat cereal. So I never eat bacon. And I just savored that bacon. <laughs> and, and my language is I transposed the music of bacon taste to love for God. I, did, here's the, one more example. Because sure. this is really where we all are. After about a year of preaching at Bethlehem in 1980, one of the men in our church, he's still there, 35 years later, he's, he's still there, and he came up to me and he said, I don't have any experience corresponding to your, your, your emotion talk and your delight talk and your satisfaction talk in God. That is just a foreign language to me. I am not that kind of person. This is a, this is a, a Scandinavian church. <laughs> and I said, I don't believe you. You ever, I, I said, w w what do you do in summer for, for fun? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you got to start where people are, right? He said, well, I, we go to the Boundary Waters. Oh, Boundary Waters, northern Minnesota. Tell me about it. He said, well, you go to the Boundary Waters outside this city, and you you." put out your mat at night with no tent overhead and look into those stars. I said, whoa, whoa, Mike, Mike, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Can you, next time you go up there and you lie down on your back and it's, you're just before to start to sleep and this is a sheet of white and you are drawn out of your little city self to feel something magnificent and big, can you just transpose that music? up to the maker. Can you do that? Just do that. Try it. Because that's, I think that's the way it's designed. I got a whole slew of quotes here from Lewis, but I, I won't take the time on this. This is really important that all of you learn how to transpose the music of natural pleasures given by God into the music of delight in God. If you can't do that, you'll remain an idolater. You'll be a spirit, um, a carnal, unspiritual person just hitting the ceiling of the, of the skies and never breaking through. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And if you, if you only love the heavens, you're not going to be saved. And if you want a sample of that, short of Edwards, read Psalm 8. What do we do about having mixed motives? Must my motives for doing something be only God's glory? What if I still have remnants of selfishness? Should I wait until my motives are totally pure? Or do I accept that as part of being human? You should not wait and you should not accept. Um, so nobody in this room has pure motives. 
Therefore, if you wait, you'll never do anything. But if you say, not a problem, I'm just human, you don't, you don't hate sin enough. And you'll never sing the song that talks about sin no more, save to sin no more. You'll never sing that song with tears the way a lot of people do and should. So the answer is, no, you don't wait. You move forward, repenting all the way and loving the gospel, just loving the gospel, right? I mean, what else did he die for except those mixed motives? My only hope, my only hope of heaven is that my mixed motives are forgiven. If, if, if I wait until John Piper has a pure motive, I'm not doing anything. And some of you, now, there's personality issues at, at work here. Some of you are wired to feel so guilty that you're paralyzed. You can hardly move because you feel so bad about knowing what selfishness is still there in your heart. And others of you never struggle at all. <laughs> and, and, and both of you need to move. And you move by the gospel. The gospel helps the, the struggler break free from the paralysis of, I'm just so bad, I can't do anything right. Embrace the gospel and you do what you can do. And the, and the person who never, you know, never has any problem at all because they don't feel or don't have any introspective bone in their body, they need to read the gospel, hear the gospel, and know that the gospel indicts them and then saves them. Mm -hmm.